What did you just say? Can I have a pen? I can't talk without a pen. That makes a lot of sense. When you're crazy, you sometimes have to let your hands do the talking. The way you deal with this is you learn to enjoy being a passenger in your own body. They told me I have multiple personalities. They told me I don't fit in. But in a war between individuality and conformity, the individual is always outgunned. The conformists have the machines on their side. They think they've got all the angles covered. But they forgot two important things. Crazy people, we don't play by the rules. We have a predator that came from the depths of the cosmos and took over the rule of our lives. Human beings are its prisoners. The predator is our lord and master. It has rendered us docile, helpless. If we want to protest, it suppresses our protest. If we want to act independently, it demands that we don't do so. I have been beating around the bush all this time, insinuating to you that something is holding us prisoners. Indeed, we are hell prisoners. They took us over because we are food for them, and they squeeze us mercilessly because we are their substance. Just as we rear chickens in the chicken coops, the predators rear us in human coops, humaneros. Therefore, their food is always available to them. The human body generates more bioelectricity than a 120 volt battery and over 25,000 BTUs of body heat. Combined with a form of fusion, the machines had found all the energy they would ever need. Sorcerers believe that the predators have given us our systems of belief, our ideas of good and evil, our social mores. They are the ones who set up our hopes and expectations and dreams of success or failure. They have given us covetousness, greed, and cowardice. It is the predators who make us complacent, routinery, and egomaniacal. In order to keep us obedient and meek and weak, the predators engage themselves in a stupendous maneuver. Stupendous, of course, from the point of view of a fighting strategist. A horrendous maneuver from the point of view of those who suffer it. They gave us their mind. Do you hear me? The predator give us their mind, which becomes our mind. The predator's mind is baroque, contradictory, morose, filled with the fear of being discovered any minute now. I know that even though you have never suffered hunger, you have food anxiety which is none other than the anxiety of the predator who fears that any moment now its maneuver is going to be uncovered and food is going to be denied. Through the mind, which, after all, is their mind, the predators inject into the lives of human beings whatever is convenient for them and they ensure, in this manner, a degree of security to act as a buffer against their fear. Perfect human world, where none suffered, where everyone would be happy. Between the intro clip from Scribbling Dixie and this quote by Carlos Castañeda from Active Side of Infinity, I think you know what the topic will be in this eternal now. 
But I don't want to go among mad people. Call them what you will. Predators, archons, mind parasites, way to go, demons. But they're here, and they might already be in your or a loved one's brain. Grim tidings, but now you have a fighting chance as you arrive at the virtual Alexandria. Come get that ubic spray you've been looking for all of your life to remove the voices in your head. Spastomy! This is madness! Mush! Mush! Aeon Bitenostic Radio, an initiation by conversation into the dark corners of myth, magic, and meaning. A crash course in cult, culture, and conspiracy. A virtuous virus invoking and informing history, holiness, and heresy. Each week I, your host Miguel Connor, commandeers your connection to bring the most accepted and rejected scholars and provocateurs to your attention. Fun, compelling, and deeply weird, this is the blow your mind cocktail party conversation you always wanted to listen in on. We're writing our own gospel and living our own myth. We're running with those searching for the truth and avoiding those who have found it. If you could be either God's worst enemy or nothing, which would you choose? We're the middle children of history. We have no special purpose or place, and unless we get God's attention, we have no hope of damnation or redemption. And yes, sir. We're fighting those entities that invade our minds and feed on our very thoughts. Like Pennywise from Stephen King's It, if you would. And the cosmology of that novel is very, very Gnostic if you think about it. It's worse than you could have ever imagined. But Gnosis demands we always stare into the abyss and gaze beyond it into pure potential and possibility. A world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries. A world where anything is possible. For this, we have the honor of being joined by Jerry Marzinski and Sherry Sweeney to discuss their new book. An amazing journey into the psychotic mind. A truly chilling yet inspirational work on possession. From Jerry confronting these mind parasites in state prisons to Sherry overcoming their darksome power, believing she was a schizophrenic all of her life. You won't be the same after this interview, but it might save your soul or the soul of someone near you. I'm afraid what you're describing is schizophrenia. No, no, it's not schizophrenia. It's just a voice in my head. The modern take on the Archons seems to be that of mind-feeding aliens. From strong thinkers like John Lamb Lash, David Icke, Lawrence Gallian, and Jay Wiedner. However, not sure if that's the view of the Archons in the Gnostic Gospels. They're presented mostly as astral thug lords, angelic bureaucrats with a penchant for rape and a narcissistic thirst for adulation. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Sure. Like the mind parasites, they thrive on negativity and weave hallucinations to confound the mind. But they also create beguiling wonder and synthetic paradises for their victims, namely all of humanity. Why is that? Because their primary purpose is to keep the essence of Sophia that fuels creation itself scattered across matter. We are that scattered essence, the divine spark, kept in a state of ignorance from this truth via both negative and positive machinations. Ignorance is the ultimate goal, the essence of Sophia the ultimate prize. 
The Archons like us to love our smartphones as much as they want us to be afraid to take up a new hobby that might improve our lives. Our impulses are being redirected. We are living in an artificially induced state of consciousness that resembles sleep. They have made us indifferent to ourselves, to others. We are focused only on our own gain. Unless I'm missing something, the powers and principalities don't directly feed off our suffering or pain. Yes, there are sections in the Nag Hammadi library that describe the Archons as mechanistic, envious of humans, and even perverse, disruptive, and chaotic. Of course, it's a busy universe out there, and Yaldi Baldi and his Archons have emanated many underlings in the sublunar realms. And then there is the counterfeit spirit of Secret John and the Pista Sophia, that epigenetic plasma enveloping our souls that forces all of our bad decisions and, yes, even bad thoughts. Choice is an illusion created between those with power and those without. Furthermore, madness is the concert of the Demiurge, as well as the mother of all the Archons, and she demands worship as much as Yaldi Baldi. Lastly, and to consider, We've talked about the dark archetype in past shows and how this principle of destruction wants us to harm everything, including ourselves, in any macro or micro level possible. I'm speculating, and let me know your thoughts, even if they're filled with mind parasites. What matters is that these predators are real, or, at the very least, should be treated as real. As Jungian therapist David Schoen said on the show, and even Carl Jung admitted to Bill W. during their correspondence. So we're ready to battle them, and Jerry and Sherry are pioneers as much as they lead the vanguard in this epic guerrilla war. Hitting bottom isn't a weekend retreat. It's not a goddamn seminar. Stop trying to control everything and just let go. Let go! You're listening to another show dealing with addiction and mental illness from an esoteric point of view. Another aspect of Finding Hermes. A podcast I hope to make a full-time podcast since so many need help in a world where traditional medicine has failed and the pharmaceutical industrial complex has only buried our divine spark deeper in our meat sacks. Only need about 20 grand to make it happen. Go fund me? Ask for donations or find a patron? What do you think? Can you help? Well, I've wrestled with reality for 35 years, Doctor, and I'm happy to state I finally won out over it. Regardless, I am grateful for your company and the amazing astral guests. And here we are, at the end of the world, now fighting mind parasites, along with egregores, archons, and alien robots named Pandora. The Empire never ended. And neither have the voices in my head. I'm supposed to act like they aren't here. Assuming there's a they at all. It may just be my imagination. Whatever it is that's watching... It's not human. Unlike little dark-eyed Donna, it doesn't ever blink. What does a scanner see? Into the head? Down into the heart? Does it see into me? Into us? Clearly or darkly? I hope it sees clearly because I can't any longer see into myself. 
I see only Mark. I hope for everyone's sake the scanners do better. Because if the scanner sees only darkly the way I do, then I'm cursed and cursed again. And we'll only wind up dead this way, knowing very little and getting that little fragment wrong. This is the A.M. Byte interview, and with us we have the pleasure of being joined by Sherry Sweeney and Jerry Marzinski to discuss their book, An Amazing Journey into the Psychotic Mind, Breaking the Spell of the Ivory Tower. Sherry, thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting us. Pleasure is all ours. And Jerry, thank you very much for coming on A.M. Byte as well. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thanks for helping us get this information out. Oh, the pleasure is all ours. I think as we've discussed, this is a very important topic that needs to be shared and glad to do so. And to help us out with this topic, as always, we've got the Moondog Vance. How are you doing, Vance? Uh, very good, Miguel. I've always thought that the psychotic mind held some secrets, and I'm hoping to hear some of those secrets tonight. No, you're, you're, you're right on. It does. <laughs> it really does. Fantastic. Oh, indeed. Yes, I think uh, if people just need only... to know how to interpret them. Exactly, exactly. Well, why don't we start with what exactly is wrong first? What has gone wrong? And that is basically, you might say, modern medicine, the pharmaceuticals and so forth that are somehow bearing or not addressing a truth which we will get into but uh, jerry do you want to take it what's wrong with medicine today well it it's it's not so much medicine it is it is psychiatric medicine um you know what they're basically what, what they're doing is you know if you if you had a car and the the, the engine light comes on and it's it's smoking it, rather than fix the problem, it's it's like they just dump more oil in there and just keep running it until the car burns up, and and that's kind of what these psychiatric uh, psychotropic drugs are doing. Uh, they destroy the patient's peripheral nervous system. Um, they cause all kinds of horrible side effects. Uh, they're they're really hard to to stomach these side effects. They cure absolutely nothing. They dumb the person down and and cause nervousness and irritability and sexual dysfunction and grogginess. I mean, they're just, they're, they're not nice pills. Uh, and they, they cure nothing. All they do is suppress the, the psychotic symptoms and the, the uh, drug industry making $3.7 billion a year just selling anti-psychotic drugs uh, all around the world. I mean, they're not looking for any cure. They're, they're making too much money just with their never ending treatments and their belief that there is no cure. Uh, but Sherry can attest that, you know, we found one and she, she found it herself and I was working along the same lines. And, and you know, it's interesting how we met. Um, you know, I, I was working with Sherry on, uh, prison reform. And uh, came up with a computer program that would educate uh, prisoners. It, it scored tests, graded tests, uh, kept a, a record. So here, here we were putting many hundreds of prisoners through drug education, and parenting, and, and alcohol education, and, and all these programs to educate them as to what what's going on with them. And uh, we would hand out booklets and. They would use that booklet as a ticket to get in and take a computer test, and they would cheat on everything. I mean, prisoners would cheat on everything. So we, my wife's a computer programmer, so we designed the program that they couldn't cheat on. It randomized the answers, it randomized the questions, and it was working real well. I mean, it was occupying hundreds of hours of inmate time. It was it was you know, far exceeded any other program they ever had. So I figured, well, other prisons ought to know about this. And I saw Sherry and said, hey, can I put this on your website? And, uh, you know, we worked for 10 years. I, I couldn't get at the Arizona system where I worked at the time, but I certainly could help her get at the Alabama system, which was much more barbaric. 
so we we were fighting the uh, Alabama system for uh, years until uh, one day I got to talking to her and I was telling her about uh, one of the psychotic patients I had and the voices he was hearing and and some of the strange things he was telling me. Now this is after knowing Sherry for probably over ten years, maybe fifteen years, and. I tell her this and she comes back and she goes, oh, yeah, I, I know all about that. You know, uh, I, I've heard voices when I was a young woman. And I'm like, what? And <laughs> she, she, she's like one of wow. the most spiritually advanced people I know. And she's sharp as a tack and her memory is like twice as sharp as mine. And, and I'm like, how could that be? So it took me back and I said, okay, let's find out. So I, I started slamming her with questions that only somebody who could, when it's hearing the voices, could answer. And it's like, bam, 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 bam. She knocked off every single one. And I'm like, you know, my mouth just dropped. I'm like, you know, what? How could this be? You can, you can tell them that's the rest of that story here. Well, yeah, after getting bombarded with all your questions, which I didn't, you know, it's like, oh, oh, this is great. You know, this, like, I have time to do this. Okay. So anyway, uh, yeah, I cooperated with him, of course, because I could sense his curiosity. He couldn't understand. I don't know what he was thinking, but, uh, you know, maybe he thought that you know, it was impossible for somebody to uh, get rid of these things on their own or something. But Oh, no, I, I, I saw there was a way to get rid of them. What I couldn't fathom was that you were the one that that was here had heard them for years and years and years i had no inkling after speaking with you for what 10 15 years i had no inkling well, you know, it's and it's you you never mentioned it well it's not something you run around and talk about you know? well that that's that's a point too because <laughs> not you know, in they, polite civilized uh, no. society <laughs> no there there is kids no can benefit do it. kids can do it fine but yeah, not us sure. <laughs> no there is no benefit to somebody who hears vo hearing voices to tell anybody no. that there, there just is no benefit. No, that's true. And uh, that was why I had to figure this out on my own because there, I knew that I couldn't tell anybody about what was going on with me because I was afraid that they would um, take me to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist would stamp me crazy and then put me in a mental hospital and drug me half to death and I would not would not be me anymore so I, mm. I my my technical scientific mind wouldn't let this just go as oh, okay let's just accept this I had to find out what it was otherwise I had to realize there really was something wrong with me and I didn't think that was the case because these these thoughts I didn't hear them as audible voices I heard them as intense thoughts in my mind that I knew didn't belong to me because you know, I'd be, I'd be going about my day and all of a sudden I get this strange thought, it, you know, would pop into my head and it's like, I, I, where did that come from? I wouldn't think that. So, so yeah, so then I was moved to figure out what was going on and that's how I just, how I found out, uh, what the voices are and how to combat them. Yeah, Sherry, we want to get to that. First, I just wanted to back up um, for the audience. The book, An Amazing Journey into the Psychotic Mind, is chock full of information, scientific, the history of paranoid schizophrenia, all the misses. It sort of takes you down that journey. And it's a grim journey. For example, Sherry and Jerry write how paranoid schizophrenia kills uh, 23 million people a year. One in 10 will die who have, while doctors who treat have doctors themselves who treat have a 5.9 percent higher rate of death and the history and all the horrible things they tried in the early days of paranoid schizophrenia sterilization uh, lobotomies malaria epileptic shock it's a dark journey but it's an important one because it tells us how modern medicine has missed it so then as the book goes we get to find out and that's why we want to know and just say it right here, uh, Sherry, what exactly are the voices in your head? Well, my take on them is that they are um, they're invisible uh, beings that have a consciousness. They're outside of our visual spectrum. And as you know, our visual spectrum is uh, pretty much pretty close to zero when it comes to the full compared to the full spectrum that's available in light. In other words, our eyes are not designed to see very much at all. 
So that so these these beings are outside of that visual spectrum. That's why we can't see them, but we can measure them. You know, we can measure their energy signature. So yes, because again, there's some good correlations in your book. Uh, I love uh, correlating them to Carlos Castaneda as the predators. Uh, of course, some might think the archons as a mind parasite demons and all that so you say that these beings are in front of us or they're actually residing inside our head like some have said like uh david ike and others the mind parasites that embed themselves in our actual brain yeah they do they are parasites because they they survive off of negative energy and they can't do they can't produce that on their own and in fact they can't create anything on their own they can manipulate reality and perception but they can't create anything. We're the creators. And, and so the way that they, since they feed off of negative energy, they have to get it from us. And the way they do that is to manipulate us into feeling a negative emotion. And then we put out a negative frequency and that's their food. Take that, Jerry. Yeah. And, and they do that. Uh, that's one of the things I, I saw working uh, i first spotted it when i was working at the uh, psychiatric hospital in, in Milledgeville, georgia is that every time the voices attacked a patient they would be totally drained of energy and then when i uh, i moved to the prison i had more latitude to work with these these people because um, if they got upset uh, you know the the noise level in in the prison was was so high that you know if they got upset it just it didn't even break the threshold of of all the craziness going on in there so uh, i noticed that uh you know every time the voices attacked that the um energy level of of the patient would drop to zero some of them after being attacked at night all night they they were so weak they couldn't get out of bed uh, some of them told me that they could actually feel their energy leaving, and uh, you know, I, I I wasn't sure what was causing that. Um, and I guess you you experienced the same thing, right, Sherry? You you actually felt that energy being drained from you. I did, and I mean, there, I would be very very weak uh, after after a severe attack. There were levels of attack. Some were not so bad, but all of them were bad. But there were there were levels higher uh, than others. So yeah, yeah. So I I felt a complete drain. Of, I had no energy at all. Yeah. So that that happened with with virtually all of them. But I had no idea what was causing that. And for more than a decade, I think I thought it was due to the extreme anxiety caused by the voices screaming at the patient day and night and calling them names and making them paranoid and, and whatever. Um, then one day uh, I was I was put over the, the, what they called it in the prison was the central detention unit. And that was the jail for the entire prison complex. So the worst of the worst went there. And uh, they they always seemed to manage to assign me to the the, the roughest place, and I I didn't mind yeah. because I was an energy uh, adrenaline junkie. So one day I came into my office one morning, and here was a um, inmate letter from a inmate in the central detention unit, basically saying, "Listen, my my cellmate." is psychotic and he's standing over me at three in the morning just staring down at me and he's hearing voices and doing weird stuff and I can't deal with this. Um, that same morning, maybe an hour later, I got a call from the captain of the that, that particular unit asking me to come over and do something with this psychotic guy who's in the cell with this other fellow. So I looked up the record on the, the fellow who wasn't psychotic to see what was going on with him. And what he had done was snitched off the Aryan Brotherhood in the prison. To, uh, he snitched off one of the drug deals. And the administration broke up that gang, sent 
sent members, the, the leaders all over the state to different prisons and confiscated their drugs. And they were so pissed off, they wanted this guy dead. They'd already stabbed him once. So he was actually over at the Central Detention Unit for protective custody. And what they did, they wanted him dead so bad that they would get into trouble to get sent over to the CDU so they could get at this guy. And and what they were doing was throwing notes under his uh, door saying, yeah, listen, you come out of there. We got you. We're, we're here waiting for you. You're a dead man. And then here's this poor guy locked in with this florid psychotic. He's got the gangsters trying to kill him on the outside and, and oh, his, wow. his florid psychotic cellmate staring at him at three in the morning, just looking down at him in the dark. And the, the poor guy's like, you know, help me. So I kind of went over there. And uh, they were both in the same cell. So you couldn't have more a, a more perfect experimental situation. I mean, everything was equalized. You know, the, the cell, the, you know, the the environment, the food, the guards. I mean, everything was equalized. These guys were living under almost the same exact situation. So I pulled out the um, the guy who the gangsters were trying to kill first. And I watched him come up the uh, steps. Uh, up to the second level to the interview office in that unit. And uh, he he had plenty of energy. He kind, of, he kind of bounded up the steps. He didn't need to use the railing. He he moved pretty quickly into the interview room, and I, he started telling me his story. And he was, you know, he was upset. He was scared. But he had plenty of energy. You know, he wasn't, you know, depressed to the point where, uh, you know, he just didn't have, energy to speak he, he was he he was plenty lively uh, but he was scared so after listening to him i said well okay i'm gonna i'll do what i can to, to help you out sent him back and then pulled out his cellmate who was not on any medications he was floridly psychotic he was hearing a bunch of voices um, and I watched him come up the stairs and he had he he could barely make it up the stairs. He was holding the handrail. He was pulling some, himself up. He was he looked like he had lead in his boots. Uh, he shuffled across the, uh, the the hallway and then sat down in the office and just kind of looked like a limp dish rag. Um, he was hearing a bunch of voices. They were attacking him bitterly, very very hard. And he had no medications and he needed them badly. So after watching that. I, I walked out of there and I go, no, it's not the anxiety. It's, it's it's not the anxiety that is causing this energy drain. And and I'm kind of going, well, okay, so if it's not the anxiety, then what is it? Because there was a one-to-one -one correlation between the attacks of the voices and the the energy of these patients just being drained to nothing. And they would they would recognize that if you brought it up. If you say, hey, you notice that your energy has gone after these things attack? And uh, they go, well, yeah, yeah. but it, it's something they, they kind of didn't see on their own. If you pointed it up, they'd agree to it. And then you'd ask them, like, well, where, where did it go? Where did, where did your energy go? And they would, most of them would go, I don't know. You know, I don't know. And, uh, you know, since there was a one-to-one -one correlation, uh, I, would, I would point out, I'd say, well, okay, every time, the voices come, you're drained of energy, right? They go, right. Okay. Well, then where's your energy going? Well, I don't know. And, and that was almost a unanimous response. I don't know. Every once in a while, one of them would say, the voices take it? You know, kind of like questioning. But I would say 90% of them would, would say, I don't know. And then I'd tell, ask them, I'd say, well, okay, if you... If you stuck your hand in a fire, and every time you stuck your hand in the fire, you got burned, what's burning you? They had no problem answering, well, it's a fire. And I said, well, okay, if the voices came a thousand times, and each time they came, when they left, you were completely drained, where'd your energy go? Well, I don't know. They, they couldn't see it. They were blocked from seeing it. So I started uh, a survey, a one to ten survey. How much energy did you have before the voices came? How much energy did you have after the voices came? And it was consistent. Uh, I, I surveyed 
you know, maybe 30, 30 schizophrenics, maybe more. And every single response was, yeah, the energy is much less subjectively. We ran that through, I think it was analysis of variance, and it came out statistically significant. Um, but then to get them to, to, um, to realize that was an, uh, another story. And the, the other thing I saw was that they, almost all of them went off their drugs eventually. And I didn't understand why that was, especially at the state hospital. Uh, they would go off their drugs and they would go nuts. And it would be like they would sabotage themselves. So we had uh, a vocational school type complex at the state hospital where uh, we would send these patients. And most of the sharpest ones were schizophrenics if they took their medicines. Yeah. But they would all eventually go off their meds and then they would mess up in their classes. They'd get thrown out or we'd successfully close them out, ship them to the uh, community, and then they'd go off their meds out there. So I'm going, well, why, why are they continue going off their meds? Do, do they want to go insane? Do they want to go crazy? And, and it's like it, it was a perplexing problem. Who, who would want to go off their medications and go crazy? So I started asking them about this. Why every single one that went off their meds? Why why did you go off your meds? Well, I don't like the side effects, and that was the standard answer. Every single one would say, "I don't like the side effects," but that didn't make sense either because the you know the repercussions of being psychotic are are much worse than the side effects. Although the side effects are awful, so it's like if you ask them, they go. You know, what do you want? Do you, do you want the flu or do you want the bubonic plague? And they would consistently choose the bubonic plague. They would consistently choose the worst of the two choices, which just was totally, totally irrational. And uh, it made no sense to me, but they would all say, oh, I went off the meds because of the side effects. So what I did is got two pages. One, I listed all the negative aspects of paranoid schizophrenia, which took like a page and a half, almost two pages. And I made a handout. So, so I'd bring the, the ones who went off their meds and, and they got back on, they were stabilized. I'd ask, why'd you go off your meds? They'd say side effects. So I'd give them a blank sheet of paper and I'd say, write down all the side effects you experienced from the, you know, the medications you were taking, because they're different for different medications and not all patients have the same side effects. So they wrote down the ones that they experienced, which, you know, might have been, you know, five or eight. And then I handed them the sheet with all the uh, symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia, all the psychosis and voices and the uh, hallucinations and the, 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 uh, all, the, all the horrible symptoms. And I said, okay, pick, pick, pick the symptoms that you experienced out, all, off of this list. So they checked a bunch of them, and then I would hand both sheets back to them, and I would say, okay, which is worst? And they would say, well, the schizophrenia, the psychosis is worst. And then I'd ask them, then why did you go off your medications? If being psychotic is worse than these side effects, why did you go off your medications? Every single one of them, and this went on for years, answered, I don't. No, and I'm kind of going. If they don't know, then who does? Yeah. So th th this went on for years, and I just kept asking and asking. I started feeling like a nut myself, asking the same question over and over again, and, and expecting it, uh, eventually a, a different answer. So it, it was maybe a year or two years down the line. Uh, one gal went off her meds for the third time. She was about to get thrown out of her cosmetology program because if they can't stay on their meds, they're not going to be able to work. And they were about to discharge her for lack of cooperation and not staying on her meds. And, and I got a call from her mother in South Georgia and said, please don't discharge her. You know, I'm, I'm going to come up. I can't handle her at home. She's got to succeed at this. I'd like to come up and talk to you and her together. And um, I said, okay, well, come on up this Friday. Uh, we set up an appointment. I 
had her mother come into my office, had her come into the office, and she knew she was in trouble. She knew she was about to be discharged from the program. And her mother and I were both asking her, why did you go off your medications? Why, why did you do this a third time? Now you're about to get thrown out of the program. And, and she knew, you know, that the, the, the psychotic symptoms were worse than the side effects. She, she'd already known that. I, I asked her, well, then why? Why did you do this a third time when you knew you were going to get in trouble? And for the first time, she comes out and she says, the voices told me that I was being poisoned by the psychiatrist and that the medications were poison. Wow. And uh, she pointed to the side effects and, and said the voices told her that the side effects were the results of her be, getting poisoned by the psychiatrist. And they convinced her to go off the medications. So when I heard something like that, I just didn't take it at face value. I, I would log it down. Then I'd start asking other patients the same thing. And it was consistent across the board. The voices got them to, to concentrate on the side effects of those medications and the bad stuff about the medications and eventually got them to quit taking the medication. So the medications were one of the first things that the voices went after when psychiatry put them on those medications. Wow. That's, yeah, it's incredible. And it's documented in your book. Uh, a few comments from me. It's interesting what uh, Sherry was talking about, how they need energy. When I was I was uh, in a past life, I was a ghost hunter, and we go to places in Chicago looking at Al Capone's, uh, where you hung out and kill people. And, of course, we always knew that there was activity when the temperature would go down because, obviously, these entities need energy, electromagnetic energy. So, of course, they drain the heat. I, I never thought they were ghosts. Something told me that it was like we were creating them or they were with us. So, and uh, very interesting. And also, you, as you point out, Jerry, of course, prisons are a breeding ground for negativity. So oh, that's yeah. The they're, perfect, they're, they're like a buffet for them. Oh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, and you, you can feel uh, it. Yeah, you also said that wasn't it a, a book on shamanism that really changed oh, your yeah. mind? I mean, shamans yeah. have been fighting evil spirits for thousands of years. <laughs> yeah, do it a lot better curing it than, than psychiatry. <laughs> Amen. Is. Yeah, but but yeah, um, that that was a uh, another aspect. So while I was in the state hospital, uh, I had to be real careful because there they had like an unwritten rule: you don't irritate psychotic patients because i mean it's logical you, you don't know what they're going to do so psychiatry was kind of afraid of them because they would assault psychiatrists uh at a higher rate than they would any other member of the staff that's psych nurses that's psychologists that's counselors that's teachers the assault rate on psychiatry was equal to the assault rate on attendants that were with these guys 24 hours a day so here I am thinking, like, what is psychiatry doing to piss these guys off in 20 minutes, you know, uh, once a month that gets them so upset that they're attacking these guys at a rate higher than they are attendants that are with them 24 hours a day that made no sense to me. And, and that didn't click in until this gal told me, well, the voices are telling me not to take the medications. And who's giving them the medications are the psychiatrists. Right. And and one thing that's really interesting is that if you look at the statistics for uh, the uh, the psychiatrist suicides and and major, uh, assault rates, it some very interesting stuff comes up. So if you look at the assault rate on psychiatrists, now this is from the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry of August 1980, the assaults for all jobs, this was a study of 120,000 assaults on all jobs from 1987 to 1992, over five years, reported that the assault rate for all jobs was 12.6 per thousand. The assault rate for regular doctors other than psychiatrists is 16.2 per thousand. The assault rate for custody staff, that's attendants who are around these, these psychotic patients 24 hours a day, 69 per 1,000. 
Now, the assault rate upon psychiatrists for the little time they spend around these patients, according to the Journal of American Medical Association, the assault rate on psychiatrists is 65 you know, per thousand, or 5.9 times higher than the general population. Their, their murder rate is also uh, you know, uh, higher, and their, their suicide rate is almost exactly the same as the schizophrenics patients with it's three to five times as high as the normal population. The, the suicide rate of schizophrenics, which, which is high, is almost exactly the same as the suicide rate of psychiatrists. Oh, wow. Which is bizarre. Bizarre, yes. I mean, incredible stuff. I guess the question would, and this is for Sherry, the question would be why? I mean, why you? I mean, I was there was one part of the book where you were a child and you were going to give a baby a bath and the voices were telling you, put that baby in scalding water. It was chilling and it was heart-wrenching. But why you, Sherry, or why certain kids? Well, I think that what ha when a when a child is abused in life in early life, uh, they they there's a door that opens. It's like Jerry talks about when when people take amphetamines, they open up a door for them to enter. And I I'm quite sure that anybody that's been abused, whether physically or emotionally, there there's a door that opens up for these these entities to enter in. So I, I believe that that's what happened. Well, they also feed off of negative emotions. So uh, somebody who's been badly abused sexually, physically, emotionally, they're generating already those memories that trigger negative emotions. So these things are like sharks that smell blood out in the ocean. They will gravitate you know, to people who are, are emotionally damaged and bleeding and, and just kind of throw fuel on the fire. Well, and, and Swedenborg, Swedenborg mentioned that they don't like children because of their innocence, I think. Mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the nastiest battles I've seen was be, between the voices and psychotic mothers, where the voices are telling them to hurt or kill their children. And, and the, that motherly instinct is, I mean, it, it's just a, a, some of the most savage battles I've ever seen were, were between the motherly instinct not to hurt the child and the voices demanding that they do and the mothers didn't always win and the thing the thing that is bothersome to me is that when i was little and i, I you know i heard these thoughts like the the child in the orphanage to put that child in the scalding hot water i didn't do that thank goodness but i'm i don't know how many other children would have the presence of mind not to do that because I mean, I, I just could, you know, I just couldn't do that. That wasn't me. And I don't know how many children, you know, we, we read in the newspapers about children killing children. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just heart wrenching to hear that. And I'm wondering if they had the voices telling them to do that. Well, they, they do get us all. I mean, to different degrees, you know, then. Yeah, but a child is a child is more vulnerable to paying attention to doing what the voices say. I think. Well, it it it's, it kind of starts out after they learn language because the voices have to manipulate language. So before they before they learn to talk, I mean, you don't have any you know demonic children for the most part. It, it, it's once they learn. Uh, language and and the voices can manipulate the language and and put the thoughts into their head. Do you think there's something with development of theory of mind too? Um, because if you don't have a good theory of mind, that is, you know, for people that are listening don't know about that, the ability to imagine the other person is a conscious person like yourself that must make it easier for these voices to get the victim to do their bidding. Well, you, you look at, the, it all centers around where does, where does thought come from? Uh, and Swedenborg does a, you, I don't know if you've read anything by Swedenborg. He's a Christian mystic that lived about 700 years ago. And he, yeah, a little. Yeah. He, he was allowed, I mean, he was one of the top, 
scientist of his day. I mean, he was a mining engineer. He was a, a inventor. He was a kind of a physician. He, he knew almost everything that the scientific world knew at that time. And he traveled all over Europe. And, and then at about age 50, he something told him, okay, you're done. You're done with the physical world. Now turn and explore the spiritual world. So he, he dropped all his scientific work and turned to the exploration of the spiritual world. And he was allowed to enter heaven and hell. He would usually go into a trance, be gone for three days, and then come back and write about his experiences over there. And uh, one of the first people who made the link between the voices that schizophrenics here and evil spirits was Dr. Wilson Van Dusen, um, who I worked with for a little over a year. Uh, who was a clinical psychologist at one of the psychiatric hospitals in California. And he wrote about his conversations with the voices of schizophrenics. And he would actually carry on long conversations with the voices in an attempt to befriend them, to learn whatever they could teach him while he you know, was making friends with them. And he would promise them that he wouldn't hurt them. Uh, he just wanted to know about them. He actually asked them to take an MMPI once. So that's kind of like the gold standard for psychology diagnosis. So he, he would give the patient that MMPI separate and say, don't let the voices answer any questions. You, you answer this on your own. And then he would give it to the voices and tell the patient, just let your voices answer these questions and don't interfere. So he scored up both uh, both those M MMPIs and Rorschachs, and the results were that the voices were more psychotic than the patient. I found that pretty interesting. Definitely. Um, well, to to address Vance's question about uh, whether a person relates to another person as though they're a conscious being, I I was remembering when you said that that you know when when I grew up it was. Uh, it was children are to be seen and not heard. And so we were not treated like little people. We were just treated like things. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe if a person is not considering that the other person is a conscious being, it's no big deal to hurt them or to, you know, kill them or uh, abuse them or something like that. Is that what you were getting at? Oh, yeah. And, uh, but even uh, I think you pointed out something extra, which is perhaps empathy is taught by your parents and the people around you when you're young. Yeah, I didn't learn empathy until I went into the orphanage where because I, I, I hated seeing the girls being beaten, that all of, all of us were being uh, totally abused by the nuns behind those walls, those beautiful walls. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't know about empathy, but I, I, until later when I grew up and understood what the word meant. But at the time, I'm sure that that's what I was experiencing because it, it hurt me worse to see them get beaten than it did for me to get beaten. Wow, that's really terrible. And yeah, and again, the places where there's high negativity. And you both uh, mentioned Swedenborg, and I've read Swedenborg, but I've only read it like the nice stuff, the going to heaven and marrying your spouse in heaven and the different universes. Uh, how exactly did his work uh, help crystallize your ideas? Obviously, as you write, he's got plenty on evil spirits. When I first hit his book, Heaven and Hell, I, it, it, it was strange how it happened because a, a, a staunch Catholic introduced me to Swedenborg. And I walked into his his house one day and here's a, a book in manual Swedenborg and this guy with a wig on and I looked at it and it just kind of drew my attention I said you know who's who's that and go, oh you don't know about manual Swedenborg I go, no I never heard of him well you need to know about him here take that and read it so I read that and I went holy cow look at this you know this guy's talking about the same thing I'm experiencing in the prison with these voices. So I got his book, Heaven and Hell, and I must have read it like five times. I mean, I got it all underlined. And just like Van Dusen found, I found that the voices that the schizophrenics were hearing exactly matched what Swedenborg was saying about these evil spirits and the way they operated. Uh, 
he even talked about how he felt drained when he was uh, talking to them. And I remember when I was working, before I knew exactly what was going on at, in the prison, you know, I was so interested in these guys that you know, there were times where I'd bring three of them in in a day. And if I did that, I just, I drug myself out of there. I had no energy left at the end of the day. I had no idea why back in the early days, you know, when I was asking questions and, and kind of probing around. But I would come out of there completely drained if I saw three, and, and I was substantially drained if I saw two. But I could handle one. So I had no idea what was causing this, but I, I what I did is I spaced them out. So I saw one, at least one every day, um, and sometimes two. But, yeah, they were, they were getting me too, and I had no idea why. Yeah, that's incredible. And you were at the prison. Was there an exact turning point or did you slowly evolve? I know you talked about how you went to school, Jerry, and it sort of was disappointing because you weren't learning about the psyche, the human soul, or you, maybe you were you were very curious about the inner workings of humans. Or how did the process go when you realized, oh, my God, this is science isn't telling me the truth. I have found what's really happening. Well, when, you know, when I first started off I, in undergraduate school, I hit abnormal psychology and I was just completely fascinated with it. It was like, wow, look at this. Why is, well, why is this happening? What's going wrong with these people? And they didn't know. I mean, they, th what they would do was give clumps of sim symptoms and say, okay, these are the symptoms and they behave this way. And you kind of go, well, what makes that happen? But they didn't have any answers. All they had was descriptions. Um, and, the, and, you know, then I've I found uh, there was one time where I got I didn't I wasn't very trusting of authority anyway with the way I was raised so I I, I never fully trusted what they were telling me um, so in undergraduate school I remember one time um, that we were assigned a paper uh, written by a psychologist that basically said uh, if two psychotics met each other and they both had the same delusion one of them would have to change their delusion to something else. And, and I'm, you know, I, one of, they won't let you have access to a clinical population in undergraduate school and very limited, even in the master's program, the, the, the contact with the clinical population was very guarded and, and very, very not, not, not often. I mean, the, they, they kind of let you dip your toes in there to see what it was like, but you did not have access to work with these people. So you had to believe everything these guys are saying. And with a 90% rate of, of what they found is 90% of what psychologists write is not replicable. The, the, the stuff they write in their, in their research papers and, and their papers, is, it, they can't repeat it. So basically it's junk. And uh, I, I kind of suspected that because I knew it was like publish or perish, and that's what the, all the all the professors were all about. So I, I logged that down where where he this guy said if if two psychotics meet, one of them will have to give way. And it was probably uh, maybe 15 years later that I still had that on my mind, and I I was doing rounds in one of the psychiatric units, and uh, I would interview all the new patients that came in to see you know what we had on our hands and, and uh, how to manage them. And uh, one day I came onto the second floor of the psych unit and here's this fella walking around talking to himself. Uh, wasn't getting any trouble. He's just, he was new. I didn't recognize him before. And I, I kind of crept up behind him and I was trying to listen to what he was saying. And it was like a, a, a one way telephone conversation. He, he was carrying on a conversation with, something or somebody and and i could only hear his side of it but he was arguing with whatever it was he was arguing with and then he saw me and he turned around and uh you know i, I introduced myself and i, I asked him well, you must have just got here and he goes yeah yeah i, I got here you know, a couple of days ago uh, i said what's your name and he goes um jesus christ and i'm oh, like wow. you know, looking at him and i go Oh, okay, here's my chance. And I looked him straight in the eye and I said, no, you're not Jesus Christ because I am. And he looked at me and he's like, didn't know what to say. And I'm like on pins and needles, like, what's he going to do? 
I oh, mean, dear. is is what this psychologist wrote is 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 he going to change his delusion because you know I say I have the same one, and he 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 looks and he then he looks up at me and he goes, uh, well, okay, then we can both be, you know, Jesus Christ, and wow. and he just strolls off, and I'm going, man, they lied to me about that. You know, what else did they lie to me about? You know? uh, uh, another one was. Um, uh, th this is this this was a strange one. Um, what what they were teaching, you know, was oh schizophrenics are so disorganized they can't do advanced planning they they um, you know they can't concentrate that that well. And uh, one day I was I was in my office and I got a call from a friend in another psych unit, and he said, "Hey, uh, come come on over here. I got something you got to see, but you need to hurry up because it's not going to last long." So I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, yeah, just get over here. So I, I went over to uh, his unit, and uh, he he took me to one of the offices, and it was the office of this psychiatrist that worked in that unit. And I'd seen this guy before. This this psychiatrist, uh, uh, my friend introduced me to him, and and he he dressed just like Sigmund Freud. He smoked a pipe like Sigmund Freud. He had a beard like Sigmund Freud. He was like acting like Sigmund Freud. And I'm kind of like going, how freaking bizarre. <laughs> and I look, I look at my friend that I were, I shook my head. And I go, what is with this guy? So, you know, they didn't have the highest quality psychiatrist at, at this giant psychiatric hospital. A lot of them were, were foreigners and, and, uh, you know, so this guy was, being Sigmund Freud, and it was his office that we were going to. So I walk in there, and I, I look on his desk, and and he, he, the, the psychiatrist was always smoking a pipe like Sigmund Freud. So I walk into his office, and Ed points to the middle of his desk, and in the middle of his desk is this pile of crap shaped into a pipe. So what had happened, one of his patients who really didn't like him, and this guy was a, a psychotic patient. He was hearing voices. He had managed to slip down, I think, three or four flights of stairs past uh, you know, three or four attendance stations. I mean, he had to get past, you know, even though the stairs were a ways off, he still had to get past those attendance stations to go three floors down to the psychiatrist's office. And then somehow he broke into it. And he got up on the middle of that, the psychiatrist's desk and he crapped right in the middle of his desk and he shaped it into a pipe and then he escaped the hospital and they never found him. So I'm going, Oh, wow. Oh, oh they, they, they can't plan ahead, huh? They, they, they can't do complex thinking. Is that so? <laughs> yeah, well, how'd this guy pull that off? Yeah. So from then on, it was like I didn't trust what they were teaching about psychotics. Um, and then when it, it, I got into the um, uh, on the wards and watched the psychiatrist prescribe medications, and I would ask him over and over again, I said, "Well, what what is happening with these guys? What uh, what what causes schizophrenia?" And virtually all of them, not all, uh, virtually all, but not all, uh, would say, "Oh, it's a chemical imbalance." Um, and some of them would say, "Well, we we really don't know." And, uh, but most of them would say it's a chemical imbalance, but I'd, I'd watch what they did and they never had any drug tests to check what kind of imbalance it was or which neurotransmitters were out of balance or w what needed to be done to fix this imbalance or what was imbalanced. They would just say, oh, it's a chemical imbalance. And then they would just start their regimen of different drugs. They'd try one. It was like a shotgun, a scattergun. They'd they try one. If it didn't work, they try another. If that didn't work, they try another. But never did they give any kind of test to determine what was out of balance uh, by how much. It, it was like, you know, it, it's something they were programmed with by the drug industry. And that, that's part of what Sherry and I are talking about with the ivory tower thing. The psychiatrists are programmed by the medical schools uh, funded by the big pharma to teach pharmaceutically based treatments, and that's all they know. They can't conceive of a, a illness that has no physical cause and no physical cure, and, and they're just going going up the wrong tree on on that stuff. So it didn't make any sense that 
you know, there was a chemical imbalance because they weren't testing it. They didn't know what it was. And, and you know, you, you go into the research and they'll tell you they have no idea. And, and matter of fact, it's been disproved that there's a chemical imbalance in their brain and they have no way to diagnose any of this except by these clusters of symptoms. Um, so that, you know, <clears throat> right off the bat, I, I didn't. I didn't trust what psychiatry was, was telling me or what psychology was telling me. And I was, like Sherry, I was trying to figure out on my own what was going on. You know, I had, a, I had a, a lot more access to a lot more patients that, that I was picking through their heads. But the other thing that they were doing was that they were telling, they wouldn't talk to the patient about their voices. They would tell the patient what was wrong with them, and the patient would tell them, "Well, I'm hearing these voices, and and they're not, they're real, they're real." I'm, uh, and the psychiatrists would not ask them; they weren't even curious about what the voices were saying. They just say, "Well, no, they're they're hallucinations because of a chemical imbalance in your brain," which was a lie that was started by Eli Lilly back in I think it was the 70s when they came out with Prozac. They first they, they came out then and they said, oh, uh, this this uh, antidepressant works because of a chemical imbalance in the person's brain, and it appears that uh, it affects the serotonin. So what it was was a serotonin blocker. It was a uh, what happens when when the nerves fire. The serotonin is one of the the chemical transmitters that triggers an electrical firing of the nerve. And what these these uh, drugs do is they block the reuptake so that that serotonin isn't destroyed once it's used, which is what the, the, the nerves usually do. It's used and then they destroy it. So, and then it's replenished. So it, that drug causes a buildup of, of neurotransmitters that fire the nerves more often, which has an effect on the depression, but it doesn't balance anything. You know, it, it just, it, it, it's kind of like, you know, amphetamine for your nerves a little bit. Um, wow, it's incredible. Yeah, it's amazing how everything they told us is a lie, which is, uh, <laughs> uh, this is, well, that's the point of AM Diagnostic Radio is to, to weigh through these things. Again, if it worked with the shame and the ancients, probably a good thing. But turning to you, Sherry. First, I'd like to say for the audience, check out our old interview with Susan B. Martinez on her book, Field Guide to the Spiritual World, because she, it's the same topic, it's, except she goes with serial killers, how they had the voices in their head, abusive childhood, and all these, again, symptoms and lives. And she comes to the conclusion that, yes, it was a, some sort of spiritual or demonic possession. Call Again, call them archons, call them predators, call them uh, way to go, whatever you want to call them. But important thing is to treat them. But to you, Sherry, do these entities, can they have any sort of omniscient where they can see beyond you and help out in some other way? I mean, and do they completely have access to all your memories? Yeah, they have access to all of our, all of our, your memories, and in fact, you they have access to memories that you've forgotten long ago. I saw that too. Yeah, they have a knack wow. to turn something. They have a knack to turn a good memory into something bad. Yep. Uh, yeah, they'll twist it and turn it, and uh, you know they'll bring up a memory. And even if it was something that you did right, they'll make you feel, or they'll work at making you feel uh, that you did something wrong. And, uh, you know, they'll do anything at all to to make you have a, a negative emotion. But as far as going beyond me, I don't think they ever did that. They couldn't they couldn't do that. And Van Dusen found that, too, that they they only had the memory. They only had the experience that the individual had that they were occupying. Well, I, I've seen them go beyond uh, and do supernatural things uh and and had lots of reports on it, like uh, uh, drug addicts, especially with meth. When they ran out of meth, the, the prisoners, one after another after another, would tell me that when they ran out of meth, the voices would come and tell them where to go and when to be there, and somebody would show up with the drug. They would tell them which houses to rob and when to go in there. So there was one prisoner uh, who I was talking to about his voices, and, and they would pick the house 
to rob. They would tell him when to go there. Uh, they would tell him when the occupants of the house were up. And this one fella, uh, he, he was, you know, bragging about how, how he got away with all these robberies and how the voices helped him. And I finally asked him, I said, well, you know, if the voices were, uh, so great, how, how come you're in prison? And he said, well, I got greedy and I broke into a house I shouldn't have. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, he told me of one, one break in that he, he was in. He was in the, the house. He'd crawled in the window. He was actually in the house. He said they would tell him generally where the loot was, but not exactly, just the general area, which is interesting. And, uh, he said that the voices told him that the occupants of the house were up and he, went to leave just as they came in the room. He jumped out the window and he started running up an alley to the left. And the voices told him, no, don't go up there. The police are going to come down that alley. Go to this, uh, go down this road to the right. So he, he started running down the road to the right. And just as he disappeared down that road, the police did come up in down that alley. He was going to run down. And the voices told him that uh, there was a, one of those big metal dumpsters uh, there he's they told him go jump in that dumpster and close the lid so he went and jumped in the dumpster and just a, uh, a few minutes later a cop walked by with his gun drawn and the, and the a flashlight on and uh, he passed the dumpster and then the voices said okay now get up and and run get out of there and he said no no there he's too close I, I can't leave yet and the voices said no you leave now so the guy quietly got out of the dumpster and 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 left when the cop was way too close for his his liking and and escaped back to his uh his his room his apartment and the voices when he got back the voices are telling him hey good job good job and he goes well no not so good job i left all the loot in the dumpster and they said no big deal you can go back and get it tomorrow morning oh, wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there was there was another one um this guy was a uh he had a long long record he was here and he th this guy completely recovered I mean, we worked with him and completely recovered, but he told me one story of uh, when he was in um, San Diego and he was using a lot of meth and, and other drugs. He was hearing voices uh, all the time. And one day the voices told him, um, get, get two burlap bags and take your $250, get in your car, and we will show you where there is a big sesamelia pot field in Oregon. So he trusted him. I mean, they were telling him stuff like this all the time. Jumps in his car, gets, has his burlap bags, has his $250 gas money. And uh, he's following what they're telling him where to go, turn by turn by turn. And he, he ends up on a dirt road. He goes like, I don't know, 20 miles down a dirt road or something. And it, it ends up at the base of a mountain. And uh, he stops the car and he goes, well, okay, what do I do now? And the voice has said, there's a hiking path off to your left. Uh, about four miles up that path, uh, you'll find the field. So they said, take your, your bags and you know, take your machete and go up there and, and you'll find them. So he, he walks up that path and he, you know, after a couple of hours, he, he comes upon this giant sesamelia pot field. The voices said, cut them down, you know. So he fills up those two burlap bags, goes back to his car, uh, and he says, okay, what do I do now? The voices said, well, we know a park where you can sell this stuff. So they tell him right where the park is. And he's selling, he's selling that, uh, you know, high quality dope to everybody at the park. And he, he, he made so much money. He had all the prostitutes he wanted. He had all the cocaine he wanted. He had all the alcohol he wanted. And what was surprising is they were, the voices were fishermen. They wanted to go fishing. And I'm like, are you kidding? He goes, no, no, they wanted to go fishing. So I, I got, <laughs> I got my fishing rod and we went out fishing. And he said the voices were telling him where to throw his hook, how long to leave it there and when to move. And he said he was the only one catching fish on, on the uh, Columbia River that day. So he, wow. he was doing that for like two weeks, you know, all the, all the prostitutes, all the drugs. I mean, he was just having the life of Riley. Uh, of course it wasn't good for him in the long run. Um, and then he ran out of the, uh, he ran out of money and he's, uh, or almost, and he goes, okay, I need to go back up there again. And they said, no. So he'd already been up there one other time. And the voices said, no, you take your money and you, you, whatever you have, you get out of here and go back to San Diego. If you go up there again, they're going to kill you. 
So he, he goes back to San Diego and, and had more money than when he left with. Yeah. So they can do stuff like that. They, they do know or they can know stuff that the actual person does not. I've seen that over and over and over again. Mm, that's, that's incredible. Not the, that's not the the norm, though, is it? Jared? No, no, that's not the norm. Yeah, in my in my experience, anyway, they they were not able to go outside of me. Yeah, and it's interesting the fishing. It's sort of a, an abomination of Jesus and Peter fishing and Jesus predicting the amount of fish. So, I guess um, obviously, these, as we'll find out, these creatures like to mock what is holy. But we also want to get maybe start getting into the cures. But before that, Vance, do you have a question for either Jerry or Sherry? Oh yeah, I got lots of them. But uh, based on this uh, last uh, the fishing story, which I think is fantastic. I mean, in a bad it's, way, but it's bizarre. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I was listening to this guy. I go, come on, man, no call. He goes, no, no. And he was, really? he was, he had gotten rid of the voices by that time. We had, we had gotten rid of them. So he was, well, he, he was in his sane mind. He was off all drugs, you know. But he, he was saying that's what happened. I, but, I swear. But this, this means some of these things. Some of these things, because Sherry's, you know, weren't. But some of these things are networked. That right? Because. The ones with him, how would they know about anything in Oregon unless they were like networked, you know, like, you know, spook net or something. And they, and they knew where the park was and where the pot field was. So do you think they can just travel back and forth or are they, are they talking to each other? Or what do you, how do you think that works? No, I, you know, what I found, and I, that's, that's an interesting question because that's one of the questions I had for these guys too. Uh, and I wanted to know if the voices in the head of one psychotic prisoner could talk to the voices in the head of another one and no it it doesn't work that way now they can talk to each other within the mind of any individual you know psychotic person they they can argue and and what you know they they drive him crazy like uh oh look what he's doing now he's uh going to the store or look what he's doing now he's picking up a book or or look how stupid he is or you know they 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 carry on this conversation about the patient it's um, like it's like a person to a, a group of people talking behind your back only you can hear them yeah yeah well, maybe they can't though. talk to each other uh, and there was one case i'm going to have to look this up where the both both people were hearing voices one was male one was female and they were dating each other and and i remember that uh, you know the interaction with that and even then the voices couldn't talk to one another. I'm going to have to find that case and, and remind myself what, what happened there. Oh, I'm so happy that you guys wrote this book. I think it's very important, and I am very happy to promote it. And, of course, I will have information on our show notes about your book and your website. And if you're out there, please get help. Help is always there from above and from individuals like Sherry and Jerry and others but uh yeah we are at the end so vance thanks uh, i'd like to thank you for coming and keeping us company as always vance oh it's fascinating and i'm glad to have been here to learn at least a few of the secrets that these voices can't help but let slip out yes so, agreed thanks agreed, and, Terry. yes uh, jerry and sherry thank you very much for coming on aeon bite now stick radio as i call it and uh Good luck with all your work. Thank you very much. I appreciated you. Uh, I appreciate you asking us to come on. Yeah, and, and helping us get uh, get this information out uh, to the public where it belongs, uh, because what they're doing isn't working. And it's it's time that we kind of started taking things and taking responsibility for this kind of stuff ourselves. Because what psychiatry is doing isn't working. Those, those drugs are toxic. They're they're doing lots of damage over the long run. Uh, the, we, we've had a, a professor who wrote an article on shamans and their, how their, their ability to cure schizophrenics. He published that in one of the uh, journals and man, the academics and the medical people just attacked him to the max. I wouldn't dare to speak about any of this if I was still working. I mean, the, the, <laughs> there would be no way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you just got to keep at it. Don't, 
we can't let them shut us down or the voices win. Well, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming on the show. And again, good luck with everything. Thank okay, you. thank you very much for having us. And there you have it, my beloved true seekers. The first part of our interview with Jerry Marcinski and Sherry Sweeney by Odin's Dingleberries. It's just as an intense ride in our second part, more than an hour extra. In our second part, Jerry relates more bizarre cases of those possessed and how we uncovered the mind parasites. We talk whether Ouija boards or spirit boxes can bring out these entities. And are individuals with multiple personalities also possess, or is it something different? Sherry will share how she finally overcame the mind parasites to live a fulfilled life after so many decades of struggle. This will lead to cures you can embrace to exercise these gremlin archons that include sacred geometry, prayer, Reiki, and more. On that note, Jerry and Sherry let us know if there are positive mind parasites. And much, much more. So please become an AB Prime member of Patreon at Patreon for the full therapy. As I always say, if you really need this content or are financially stressed, just let me know and I'll be happy to give you this show or any show on the Madhouse. Do it all the time and no worries. But your support helps grow this red pill cafeteria. I am at the point where I am getting offers from advertisers but won't take them because I only want to work for you. And it's only $6.99 a lunar cycle or whatever you want to pledge on Patreon. All for the full shows and many other rewards. For more on this, please go to thegodabovegod.com You're listening to another show dealing with addiction and mental illness from an esoteric point of view. Another aspect of Finding Hermes, a podcast I hope to make a full-time podcast since so many people need help in a world where traditional medicine has failed and pharmaceuticals have only buried our divine spark deeper in our meat sacks. Only need about, I don't know, 20 grand to make it happen. Go fund me? Ask for donations or a patron? A wealthy patron? What do you think? Can you help? Regardless, let's stay sane and let's hear the voice in our heart instead of the voices in our heads. After all, they say Gnosis is simply the knowledge of the heart. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self, here in the desert of the real. Hello and goodbye as always.